TV actor Bob Crane, star of the CBS sitcom Hogan's Heroes. Do you remember that 60s show about World War II POWs? Well, Crane was found bludgeoned to death in his Scottsdale apartment back in 1978, and almost 39 years after his brutal murder, the crime is still unsolved, and there are many questions left unanswered. Was Bob Crane's friend John Carpenter the killer? Crane and Carpenter lived on the edge, sharing a dark obsession, videotaping women during their sexual encounters. After all these years, police remain convinced of Carpenter's guilt. But early DNA testing, decades ago, wasn't sophisticated enough to positively link Carpenter to the crime. Reporter John Hook decided to use more modern tests on the DNA and blood evidence from the murder scene. Scientists believe new DNA science would eventually help identify Crane's killer. Who Killed Bob Crane is Hook's first-hand account of his two-year investigation and search for the truth. The murder is seen through the eyes of the people who were there, witnesses, detectives, prosecutors, jurors, and family members. He takes readers on a reporter's journey for an inside look at the physical evidence in a final attempt to learn who killed Bob Crane. John Hook is next when Coast to Coast AM continues. A veteran news reporter and television anchor for over 30 years in Arizona, John Hook has won more than a dozen Emmys for his reporting. Named Associate Press Anchor of the Year five times, he's covered every major story from the O.J. Simpson murder case to the impeachment of President Bill Clinton, the 1989 earthquake in San Francisco, as well as every presidential election since 1996. He anchors Fox 10 News at 5 and 9 and hosts the Emmy Award-winning Fox 10 Newsmaker Sunday. He's a graduate of Arizona State University. He was a 2002 inductee into the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism Hall of Fame. Who Killed Bob Crane? The final close-up is John Hook's first book. John Hook, welcome aboard. How are you? Great. It's an honor to be with you. You've got uh, some good friends of mine in Toronto who, who've spent many years listening to you. So uh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, I mean, just coming back with that, that theme song, which really, uh, you know, just defines my childhood. I remember racing home, I mentioned earlier, we had uh, one of those TVs with the plastic knobs on uh, when it would break off. You had to have pliers to turn the channel. <laughs> And if I got home before my sisters, that meant I got to watch Hogan's Heroes. If they got first, they got home first. They controlled the TV. They watched Here Comes the Bride. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, we share a very similar childhood, Richard. Very similar. So you uh, you went to university, uh, State University in Tempe, which turns out to be only a few miles up the road for from Scottsdale, where Bob Crane met his grisly end. Uh, but why, of all the stories you have covered, and I, I, I mentioned some of them, uh, the impeachment of Clinton and, and the O.J. trial, why your first book out of the shoot is about Bob Crane? Well, uh, it has been with me pretty much my whole life. You touched on kind of our childhood and how we were raised on this show. It, I was a little young when the show hit the air, but I, as I you know, went through my formative years, this was on heavy rerun rotation all over the country. By the way, not only big here, but in Germany as well. Surprisingly, they got a big kick out of the show. Sure. You, couldn't, you can't make a show like that anymore. It wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> no, that's right. Politically incorrect. Um, but, you know, Crane was very sensitive to that, by the way. When the show went on the air, Bob Crane was very sensitive because he had done time in the Coast Guard. He wanted to make sure before he signed on that – Servicemen and women were comfortable with this, particularly World War II vets, and they were. So once he kind of got the okay from people who had served, he thought, okay, we can do this. Crane was very sensitive to other people's feelings, believe it or not, um, despite what's been depicted. He did care about how people felt about him and how they viewed him, so he was very I'm, careful I'm, about that. I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because uh, – Certainly since the uh, the Greg Kinnear movie, Autofocus, that's all we hear about is sort of, you know, the sexual addiction and, and that dark side. Right. Uh, we tend to forget uh, that he was a devoted family man. I mean, he, 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 he just he loved to be with his family and uh, take them to the park and, and play in, in the pool with them. And that tends to get lost. 
It does. And and you asked earlier why I wrote the book. It was it was an interview with Bob Crane's son, Bob Jr. Um, about two years ago now, where he was uh, talking about his father and the father and the person that many people don't know. And as we talked about this, you know, you get a sense for a person. And I really, really liked Bob a lot. Almost instantly, we hit it off. But I felt in him a um, a loss and a profound sadness that he didn't have answers as to who killed his father. And that really started me thinking about, okay, how is there a way, would there be a way to figure this thing out after all this time? And after that interview in April of 2015, maybe it was March, late March, um, I started thinking about it. it. Would there be a way to find the evidence in the case? If we found it, would there be a way to retest it? Particularly, I'm talking now about DNA, because the DNA in the case had been tested in 1994. Uh, going into trial, it had been tested in the late 80s, early 90s. This is very primitive DNA compared to what we have now. My theory being, if we got this DNA, if we could find the blood evidence, is there a chance that we could retest it and get a more definitive result? Because everything at that point up until that point, had been inconclusive on the DNA. So your your motivation in large measure was to bring some some closure and and some answers to this poor family, the, 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 the children of, of Bob Crane. And I guess Bob's uh, ex-wife is still, is she still, she's still with us, is she not? No. She, uh, his, she's not. Well, his, his ex-wife, yes, his, his first wife, yes, is still alive, yes. Right, the mother of his, of, of Bob Jr. Yes. Uh, and imagine though I can't imagine uh, f- living 40 years and not knowing. Uh, I mean, I we you know you and I talk about as fans are sort of how it's watching that show now and repeats. It's kind of tainted in sadness. But imagine being the the children of Bob Crane and still after 40 years no answers. Uh, well, let me tell you when when I when it kind of came to me and I can't explain. It's one of those things after the interview with with Bob Crane Jr. It stuck with me. It, it haunted me for days afterwards. And it just came to me out of the blue about, well, what about all the evidence in this case? It's been, it's been, you know, it's been 20 years, more than 20 years since John Carpenter went on trial. And he was acquitted largely because the DNA evidence was inconclusive in the car of, of John Carpenter's uh, rental car. Right, and we'll get into who we'll John Carpenter was, so we'll circle back. So and and Carpenter, thought, Carpenter no longer with us either. No, he he, he passed away 20 years ago. That's almost. right, that's right. And so when I thought about it, the first person I called was Bob Jr. And I said, are you sitting down? And I detail this in the book, Who Killed Bob Crane? I, I called him and I said, Bob, um, I have something I want to discuss with you, but I, I want you to know this is not a lark. This is not foolishness. I'm dead serious about this. If we were able to find the blood and the DNA evidence from this case, and I don't know if it still exists, at that time I didn't know, I said, how would you feel about us retesting it? And there was just dead silence on the phone. And I thought I had offended him. Suddenly he says, oh my God, oh my God, yes, yes, do it, do it. He was adamant, he wanted to do it, and he wanted to help me in any way that he could. We even later got into discussions of how do we match the DNA if we found it, if we were able to retest it, how could we match it against something known? My thought was the bloody sheets from the crime scene. Right. I didn't realize at the time that we would eventually find a vial of Bob Crane's blood in evidence taken from his autopsy that we used in our testing when we sent this stuff to Cellmark Labs in Lorton, Virginia. And they're the ones who did the testing who, by the way, did all the testing in O.J. Simpson, JonBenet Ramsey. We went to the best lab probably in the world for this. All right. Um, Yeah, things just seem to kind of line up providentially almost. Uh, Yeah, Um, I would would agree. And you asked me about this kind of being with me through my whole life. As you mentioned, you know, I went to Arizona State. I came out there in, in the summer of 1978. The murder had just happened a couple of months before. Uh, at the Winfield Place Apartments at the time, which was only seven miles from my dorm. So this has been with me for all of this time, and sometimes you do kind of wonder, 
why you end up in the middle of something like this. And I say, and I mentioned it in the book, that as a kid watching Crane and going to college and hearing about the murder, I could have never imagined that I would one day end up in the middle of this thing. But that's how the news business is sometimes. You're even surprised as a reporter the places you end up. Indeed, indeed. Um, people, I think, uh, sort of forget that before television, Bob Crane was a huge radio star. He was the king of the airwaves in Los Angeles, uh, and that's where he really made his, his bones. He interviewing people like Marilyn Monroe and and the and and Ronald Reagan and so forth. Um, and then that's when he really he hooked up with this rather shady character, John Carpenter. Uh, tell me about how that happened and who John Carpenter was. Well, first of all, you write about his, his career in radio. Um, as a radio guy, Richard, you know, he was absolutely brilliant on KNX in Los Angeles. He played the drums on the air. He was a very accomplished drummer. He played drums on the air. He made spoofs out of commercials. He was just a, a brilliant comedian. And Impressionist. This is, what, this is what got, and he did voices and... He became the show in L.A. during the mid-50s to mid-60s. And his brilliance on radio is what captured the attention of producers in Hollywood. People started to hear him, and he was kind of reaching out and doing some bit parts um, in television. But producers were really, a lot of them were listening to a show, by the way. So they, they were familiar with what he could do. And, and his brilliant comedic timing really propelled him into television. And when he got the spot on Hogan's Heroes, um, Richard Dawson was a much more accomplished actor. He, you know, Richard Dawson was kind of the second guy in that cast. Um, Peter Newkirk in the show. Right, right. He, he believed, Dawson really believed that he should have been the star of the show. So this created a little bit of tension on the set, on and off. Interesting, set. interesting. Uh, in fact, Dawson didn't att attend Crane's funeral, by the way. There was some tension there. I did not know that. Yes. Um, now, Dawson and Carpenter were buddies. They were friends. And it was Dawson who introduced Carpenter to Crane. Because John Carpenter was a guy who was in the formative years of VCRs, videotape recorders. He was in that industry with Sony, Akai, later Kenwood. And he was the guy who was teaching the stars how to use this technology that nobody, by the way, Richard, had access to at the time. You couldn't go into a store and buy this stuff in the mid-60s. It was all kind of industrial. But Carpenter had it. And because of Crane's interest in photography, Crane's interest in pornography, rather than just taking still photos of his escapades, the thought of being able to do this on videotape was incredibly alluring to Crane. And so he and Carpenter were like matches and gasoline. And that's how that friendship started. And their interest, as Bob Crane Jr. told me, revolved around two things, sex and electronics. That was the tie that brought those two together. Uh, and so that was a friendship that, that was formulated back in, in Crane's radio days. And I guess it was sustained throughout uh, the run of, of Hogan's Heroes into the early 70s. Uh, and then after uh, Hogan's Heroes wrapped up, I, I think it was about 1971. I think it ran for six seasons. That's right, right. Uh, Crane's career kind of went south a little bit. I, I seem to recall, uh, I think it was called the Bob Crane Show. He did with Hope Lang in the mid-70s. It, it was very quick. He didn't get a lot of, yeah, it didn't, it didn't do well. So from there, it was the dinner theater circuit. Yeah, he did some shots on Love Boat. He did some of that, guest spots. But then it became dinner theater to pay the bills. So he started crisscrossing the country and particularly became fond of this show, Beginner's Luck. And that's the show he was in in Scottsdale and had been touring the country for several years doing that show. That's what brought him to Scottsdale, to, to the Windmill Dinner Theater in Scottsdale at the time, uh, for a month-long run of Beginner's Luck. It was a four-person show. Crane largely produced it and directed it. And that's what brought him to Scottsdale, and that's what led him to his murder eventually. That and, during that run, and uh, around this time, uh, 
Bob Crane Sr. is talking with his son, Bob Jr., uh, sort of complaining a little bit about how annoying, maybe even obnoxious, this hanger-on John Carpenter is becoming. That's right. And, and this is what the prosecution started to build as a case, and even detectives started to sniff this out very early on, that as the video technology now became commonplace. People could buy it on their own. People knew how to run it. You didn't need an expert to run it anymore. It had become much more user-friendly. And Crane had become an expert in this himself. He no longer really needed Carpenter around to help him videotape his escapades. He was very adept at doing it himself. He didn't need a guy hanging around. But Bob Crane's motto in life was, don't make waves. So to kind of, in a sense, break up with this guy who'd been hanging around for a long time, that created a lot of tension in his own mind. And according to police and prosecutors, Crane was in the middle of what would be described as a soft breakup with John Carpenter in Scottsdale. It came to a head in Scottsdale, according to police and prosecutors. There are other schools of thought about this. Some people don't buy this. But that was what led police to really feel that uh, Carpenter would have had some motive to kill Crane because Crane was cutting off their relationship, cutting off Carpenter's access to beautiful women that he never would have been able to get on his own without Bob Crane's celebrity. There's a, another touching uh, moment you describe in the book, and I, I believe it happened in and around maybe the night of the murder or the, uh, close to the day of the murder, where Crane was using some of this editing equipment, and he was, I believe it was uh, the movie Saturday Night Fever, he was editing out all the swear words so his son could watch it. That's right. That's very telling. Yeah, he was. His, for his young son, Scotty, who I believe was about seven at the time. So um, this is a son by the second marriage for Bob Crane to uh, Patty, who, by the way, was Fraulein Hilda on Hogan's Hero. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um they had a son together, and um, Crane was editing this out. Now, this becomes a very important piece of evidence because, according to John Carpenter, he called Crane the night of the murder after they had both struck out with women, called him from his hotel, and um, they had not stayed together during this trip, which they had in the past. Carpenter got a hotel room by himself. Crane stayed in his apartment. Usually the two stayed together. People felt that was a very telling thing, showing that they that, that Crane was trying to separate from Carpenter. So Carpenter, after the two strike out that night, Carpenter calls him from his um, hotel and claims that Crane is up editing this late, late at night, maybe three in the morning. Well, it's pretty evident that Crane had finished that earlier in the day. He had finished editing that earlier in the day because after the show, after, after beginner's luck, it would end about 1030, they'd go out cruise the bars, get home, blah, blah, blah. Well, they had been out with two women and struck out. It was very late. So it's unlikely that Crane was still editing that that night, very unlikely. And um, he had had to have done it earlier because his night was full. And had he, had he bedded a woman, he would have had no time to edit it because Carpenter was leaving that morning and Crane was going to give him that edited version of Saturday Night Fever to give to his son. So he wouldn't have had time to finish it had he had a woman that night. Uh, we're coming up on a break. When we come back, I'll, I'll get you to take us sort of back to June 29th, 1978 and uh, the grisly murder scene and how he was discovered and how the, uh, the, the police investigation sort of began from there and uh, further evidence that incriminated uh, John Carpenter. And then also why it took so long, 16 years after Crane's murder, uh, for uh, Carpenter to actually be tried. John Hook stays with us, veteran TV reporter with Fox 10 in Phoenix. Here's, a, here's my happy song, Shira Shira. Stay with us. Coast to Coast AM continues right after this. All right, three guesses as to who this is. I know Donna Walker back in uh, Sherman Oaks knows. She's a fan. She has the CD. This is one of the best albums of 2016. It's called Good Times, and it's by a band we haven't heard from in quite some time. 
It's the monkeys. I kid you not. The unmistakable uh, sound of, of the, mic, the melding of Mick, Mickey Dolan's and, and uh, Michael Nesmith's voices there. Beautiful, beautiful sound. Uh, that's called Birth of an Accidental Hipster. I believe that was written by uh, one of the Gallagher uh, twins, Noel or Liam, I'm not sure, or Gallagher brothers, not sure which one. Anyway, uh, it's a great album, Good Times by the Monkees, and yet another reason they belong in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I'll keep saying it until somebody in Cleveland listens. <laughs> All right, we uh, will get back to uh, our conversation uh, with John Hook, Fox TV news reporter from Phoenix, and uh, discuss his book, Who Killed... Bob Crane. Let's just have a little listen. Let's go back to uh, the late 60s, early 70s. Here's uh, Colonel Hogan and Sergeant Schultz. Hmm? What is he doing in the uniform, Colonel Hogan, please? Oh, you went too far. I must report this. It would be worth my life if I do not report this. It's only until tomorrow, and he's going to take it off again. Uh, After he steals the tank. Oh? From the Panzer Division. Oh! brings it here into the barracks. Oh, I see nothing. I was not here. I did not even get up this morning. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Bob Crane, the devilish, devilishly handsome uh, Bob Crane, making wise with the Narzis. What's not to love uh, and what's not to miss? Who killed Bob Crane? The final close-up. More, more of my conversation with John Hook when Coast to Coast AM continues right after this. Stay with us. The 1978 murder of actor and American icon Bob Crane remains one of the most high-profile, unsolved celebrity murders of all time. 38 years after his brutal murder in Scottsdale, Arizona, millions around the world still want answers. Was John Carpenter the killer, or did police arrest an innocent man? Uh, John Hook uh, stays with us. Uh, He is uh, the author of Who Killed Bob Crane?, so take us back to June 29th, 1978, uh, and uh, a young actress, Victoria Berry, arrives at his apartment looking for Bob. That's right. Um, Richard, she was going over there that day um, in the afternoon, 2 o'clock. She was supposed to meet with Crane. They were going to work on an overdub of a scene from Beginner's Luck. She was trying to get other work uh, outside of this. She was trying her best to get into television, and Crane said he'd help her. He had also betted her twice. Um, uh, during the run of Be- Beginner's Luck. So there was a little bit of a relationship. Who kn- who knows what what was going to happen in, in Crane's apartment that day. Uh, but when she goes over there, she goes for this appointment at 2 o'clock, knocks on the door, no one answers. It's getting hot out. It's about 104 degrees out. This is June now in Phoenix. Um, and she calls out for Bob's name, no answer. So she just puts her hand on the doorknob and turns it, and the door to her shock is open because Crane was a nut about locking his doors. She was really surprised. She opens the door. She walks in. It is pitch dark in there. All the drapes are pulled. It is completely dark, and her eyes, she's having trouble adjusting her eyes. She's calling out his name, no answer. She heads out to the Arcadia door, which is straight ahead as you walk through the front door of that apartment, which still exists here in Scottsdale, by the way. She walks straight out to that Arcadia door, looking out on the pool to see if he might be out swimming. She's thinking Bob's probably swimming out back. She opens the curtains, doesn't see Bob out there. In fact, I think the pool's closed because of repairs at that time. Um, She comes back in the apartment and takes a right turn towards his bedroom. She looks in and sees a figure in the bed that she at first thinks is a woman because there are streaks of darkness on the face. It turns out to be blood, but she doesn't realize that at first. Her eyes are still adjusting. She thinks it's hair, long locks of hair. Long, dark hair. Then she realizes it's blood. And the first thing that goes through her mind is that one of Bob's girlfriends has killed herself in his bed, taken her life. Because he had told her that there had been a few women he had dated who had threatened that. That was the first thing that flashed. She didn't even realize the form was a man at first. She thought it was a woman. She runs out of the apartment, screaming, um, gets the help of a woman at the apartment to call 911. And 
not it, 911 didn't exist at the time, but to call the Scottsdale Police Department. They dial zero, I think, back then. They get the Scottsdale Police Department on the phone, and Scottsdale PD rolls up, and um, and they realize uh, after a while, it took a while to figure out that it was Bob Crane lying there. Um, Victoria Berry thought it was later when she realized it was a man. She thought it was either Bob Crane or John Carpenter. Interesting so she, enough. She had met John Carpenter. She had met him. In fact, they sat together at the performance of Beginner's Luck at the Windmill Dinner Theater the night before because there were long stretches in this show. In this dinner theater, it's a little bit informal, where Victoria Berry would be up on stage, and then she'd be off stage, and she'd sit out in the audience. She'd sit at the, at the VIP table in front where Carpenter was. So she actually sat with him that night, the night before the murder. But she couldn't recognize Bob because, I mean, the bludgeon, bludgeoning was so horrific. He, he was unrecognizable. He was unrecognizable. And she was also, I think she was in disbelief. She didn't want to believe it because her mind went to maybe it's John Carpenter. And then uh, when she was in the apartment filling out her statement to police, the phone rings. And it's John Carpenter calling Bob Crane's apartment. That's the moment she realized, well, that's not, that's not John Carpenter in that bed with blood. That's Bob Crane. Bob is dead. That's the moment it hit her. Who picked up the phone when Carpenter called? Well, police were a little bit, um, they, they didn't quite know what to do. They were a little bit stunned that the phone rang. And so they asked Victoria to answer it. She did. She answered it, and it was very quick. A very quick hello, and then uh, uh, Ron Dean, Lieutenant Ron Dean from the Scottsdale Police Department, grabbed the phone and um, and said, "This is Lieutenant Ron Dean, Scottsdale PD. Who's this? This is John Carpenter. I'm calling to see uh, to see how Bob's if Bob's around." And he says, "There's been uh, an incident here, and it was a very very quick conversation, and they ended it." Well, Carpenter calls again. Uh, about 20, 30 minutes later. And that's when police were like, who is this Carpenter guy and why does he keep calling? And Carpenter is explaining during these calls, oh, I saw Bob last night, late at night, but I had to fly out the next morning. So uh, uh, Bob was going to take me to the airport, but I told him, no, you're busy. I'll do it myself. And Carpenter was trying to create a timeline, according to police, and to, and to also make clear that he was in Los Angeles, that he was back in L.A., he wasn't in Scottsdale, and try to deflect. And That's uh, a pretty bold move if, is. in fact, he's guilty to call the murder scene and and twice. Well, and, and that talk wasn't to the all, Richard. He called the One Mill Dinner Theater that afternoon twice, looking for Bob Crane. Now, Carpenter knew Crane's routine better than anyone because he hung around with him so much. It wasn't uncommon that he joined Crane on the road for three or four days at a time when Bob was playing dinner theater. Um, Crane never got to the show until right before the show. I mean, he literally drove the stagehands crazy because he was, he'd push it right to the edge. Carpenter knew by calling in three in the afternoon to the windmill dinner theater that, that Crane was not going to be there. But he, according to police and investigators, they felt Carpenter was sniffing around, eager to find out if Bob Crane's body had been discovered. If the word was leaking out about the murder. This is before internet. This is before... You know, instant communication. Um, so he was sniffing around, according to police, trying to find out what police knew and how far along they were. At what point is Carpenter brought in for questioning? Well, uh, they flew out to L.A. a um, couple of days after, after the murder, because they felt uh, when they found blood in John Carpenter's rental car, that really started to raise the hackles. I mean, they found blood in John Carpenter's rental car. There wasn't much, but it was there. And they were very suspicious at that point. Carpenter had a rental car, a Chrysler Cordoba. There were streaks and smudges of blood, about seven of them, on the passenger side of the car. When they tested it, they find out it's type B blood. That's very rare. It, one in nine, uh, well, 9% 9 of the population, one in 10 people, for the sake of argument. Bob Crane was type B. E. So now you can imagine what they're thinking. They've got a very rare blood type that happens to be Bob Crane's blood type in that car, in Carpenter's rental car. Now they're beyond suspicious. 
he becomes the, the really the sole focus. And they fly out to L.A. and they question him. And interestingly enough, when Carpenter flew back to L.A., that night when he got home after work, he went to work. And when he got home, he didn't go back to his apartment. He goes to Richard Dawson's house. So when the police finally track him down uh, at, at his apartment that he shared with a girlfriend, Carpenter was married for a long time, but he had a girlfriend also on the side that he shared an apartment with. It's a very strange relationship with his wife. Um, police track him down, and he actually called the apartment. And police said, can you come here? We want to talk to you. He said, well, I'm at my mother's house. Uh, I'm about 70 miles away. It's going to take me some time. He was actually at Richard Dawson's that whole weekend, right after the murder. It's kind of an interesting twist. It is. He it comes is. back to the apartment. They question him, and he goes over this timeline again, saying that he had seen Bob Crane the night before. They had tried to pick up these two women. They both struck out. Crane, as we talked about in the earlier segment, was editing Saturday Night Fever in his uh, boxer shorts, and they talked, and Carpenter said that he, you know, Crane was supposed to take him to the, to the airport the next morning, but that plan changed, and Carpenter said, listen, I'm going to drive myself. You're busy. I'll drive myself to the airport. And that's what happened the next morning. But police felt that the plan was for Bob to drive him to the airport. It was noted in his day planner right next to his bedside, spattered with his blood, Bob Crane's blood. It said, John leaves 10 a.m. Had it in his day planner for June 29th, 1978. And some, for some reason, that plan changed. Police think it's because John Carpenter came over to Crane's apartment and killed him. What about the murder weapon? Well, it took a while to figure that out. They didn't really sort that out until they finally brought Carpenter to trial. They figured it out in 93, I believe was the exact year, um, uh, 92 or 3. They had thought it was a golf club, a, a fire poker. Uh, they never found the murder weapon. But eventually, there was a V-shaped blood stain on Crane's bed. It looked like a V, and it, and it was outlined in blood. And police finally figured out, they said, you know, what could have made that stain? And one of the, one of the guys said, I think it's a tripod. A guy named Ray Giesel, who works for the Phoenix Police Department, was an investigator, uh, a, a really a criminologist. He said, I think it looks like a tripod. So they started looking around in Crane's apartment, and they realized from some of the porn films that had been shot that Crane had two tripods, and one of them was missing. You could see two tripods in the apartment, yet only one was there when police searched the apartment. And they started to decide, we think it is a, they were twin tripods, quick set junior tripods, about six pounds, the head of it, enough to inflict a lot of damage, and it was missing. So, 93, they come up with this. What, yes. What's going on between 1978 and 1993? It seems on the surface like an open and shut case. You've got uh, um, type B blood uh, in Carpenter's rental car, seven, at least seven smears of blood. Crane was type B. It's a rare blood type. Uh, it would appear that Carpenter had motive, opportunity. Why does it take 15, 16 years? Every prosecutor passed on it. They just didn't feel they had it. They wanted a murder weapon with prints on it. They wanted a confession. And believe me, they had two interviews with, with Carpenter, which I detail in my book, Who Killed Bob Crane. Um, I reproduced those exactly in the book, the two interviews with, with Carpenter, and one of them ends in a confrontation where they basically accuse him of killing Bob Crane, and Carpenter goes silent, and it's very tense. And I've listened to the audio recording of that interview as well. It's fascinating to listen to, and I reproduce it in the book. But what it, what it was were, were prosecutors were not sure they had it. Even though there was blood in, in Carpenter's rental car, even though it matched Bob Crane, they said, well, it's type B, but it could be from anybody. I mean, it could be from someone else who had type B who was in that car. Um, there were even some who said, well, maybe Bob Crane, who was in the car a couple of times during that week, could he have bled in the car, cut his finger, bled, something, 
But when they asked Carpenter, did Bob Crane ever bleed in your car? No. Did anybody ever bleed in your car? No. This is before they suddenly sprung it on him. They said, by the way, we found blood in your car. And Carpenter was really rattled when they told him that. And he was very curious. He said, you know, in the, in the interview, in the, in the uh, police interrogations, Carpenter was prying. He was saying, well, you know, you've told me about this blood. I, I, I don't know how much there would be there. I don't know how it would get there. He was rattled, no doubt about it. I've listened to it. Um, but the prosecutors just didn't feel they had it, Richard. So it took a different prosecutor in 19, who was elected in 1988 here in, here in Arizona, a guy by the name of Rick Romley. Um, and Rick Romley was the one who said, I think we should pursue this further. And they started the whole investigation from scratch in 1990. And two guys, Barry Vassell from Scottsdale and Jim Raines, who was with the county attorney's office, made it their life's mission to figure this thing out. Yeah, I think it needs to be noted that this probably remains Arizona's most famous murder. Yes. And, you know, we call it here, one of the investigators, Jim Raines, called it our Kennedy assassination. I know that's a strong term because, you know, Kennedy is a, you know, mythical, legendary figure. But the point is that he's making an analogy that there are so many theories out there, so many crazy, wild theories. Books have been written. Movies have been written. Speculation. It's the ultimate whodunit, that there are some parallels to Kennedy, that people have all kinds of theories about what would have happened. And, you know, one of the central questions about this whole thing that I had to answer before I wrote the book is why would anybody care about a 40-year-old murder? But let's remember, Crane is still visible on reruns. He's still with us. He's been with us throughout our lives. And it would be like, let me give you an analogy, if Ashton Kutcher had been killed in this way, or better yet, maybe a better analogy, Charlie Sheen. That's the kind of figure that we're talking about. And, and you, you talked about it at the beginning. We grew up with this guy. He's part of our lives, and people still have a connection to him. Anybody over 35 probably does. Right, right. And although on the surface, I mean, in hindsight, it, uh, and they, of course they didn't have benefit, uh, benefit of the DNA testing, it, it would seem an open and shut case. But if you take Carpenter out of the equation for a moment, you mentioned Kennedy. Uh, you know, one of the big puzzles was who wasn't lined up, uh, you know, ready to take a shot at Kennedy. Exactly. You had the Great mob. Point. You had this, the military-industrial complex. You had uh, the drug Cuba. syndicates. You had Cuba. Uh, and Russia. with Crane, it, Russia. And with Crane, obviously, uh, you know, the potential for a long list of angry fiancés, boyfriends, husbands, yes. and who else? Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. But when the investigators reopened this, in the early 90s, they went through all those people, and many of them who looked like they might be interesting, and they felt, you know, they had to do it because they didn't want to get to court and be accused of not having dotted their I's and crossed their T's. They needed to interview everybody again. They started from scratch, and most of these people were not there. They weren't in town. They weren't around. They had an alibi. I mean, they went through the list, and you know, yes, is there somebody they may have missed? That's what's so alluring about what I have written in Who Killed Bob Crane, because the DNA tests cast doubt, even though everything points to Carpenter. Then we get these DNA tests, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, when we come back after the break, but the DNA tests cast some serious doubt, because what they recovered in that car that we tested did not match Bob Crane. Wow, there's a bombshell. It is a bombshell. It's a bombshell. All right, well, we will indeed uh, regroup, come back on the other side. John Hook will uh, talk about how he uh, began his investigation, picking it up 40 years later, starting from scratch. It's remarkable, perhaps even miraculous, uh, that uh, much of this evidence was still in existence. I mean, three weeks after Bobby Kennedy was uh, shot, the acoustic tiles were gone where the where the bullets were. The the bullet fragments were gone. But here we are 40, 40 years later, and uh, much of the evidence uh, is still intact. John Hook, my guest, and we will continue to discuss who killed Bob Crane. Here's Ringo Starr taking us into the break with You Know It Ain't Easy on Coast to Coast AM. 
Welcome back to Coast to Coast. Richard Serrett coming to you live from Coast Toronto, Canada, affiliate talk radio AM 640. John Hook is with us, Fox TV news reporter uh, in Phoenix. And uh, the book, his first book, is Who Killed Bob Crane? Uh, So uh, John Carpenter is uh, acquitted in 1994. He passes away in 1998. You pick up the story in 2015. Uh, Where do you begin? And this is a case that's 40 years old. Right, exactly. Uh, let me. I, I need to uh, put this out there because people are pinging me, Richard. Um, if you want to pick up the book, go to whokilledbobcrane.com. Everything's there, and you can order it, but it's at every bookseller imaginable. So it's coming out February 21st, so thank you for that. Excellent, um, and we've also linked up to, uh, to, to that website at uh, coasttocoastam.com. I appreciate that. So thank you. Just click on your name, where, and it's right there. I get it, and I want to let them know. Um, after, after the interview with Bob Crane Jr. in uh, March, late March of 2015, we start searching for the evidence. This took a lot of time. Uh, first of all, the county attorney's office down here, the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, I give them a lot of credit even allowing me to do this. I asked them, does the evidence still exist? Nobody knew where the evidence was. It took months to find it. It turns out it was at the county attorney's office in their evidence room, but it took a long time to find it. There could be a couple of reasons for this. One of them was we had a freeway shooter down here that that was eating up a lot of investigators' time, and I fully understand that. This wasn't high priority for them, but I said, I want to find the evidence from the Crane case, and I particularly am interested in the blood evidence and the potential for possibly retesting the DNA. The county attorney down here, Bill Montgomery, As they reviewed it, when they finally found the evidence, he said, if you can find it in there, I am not opposed to him retesting it because Carpenter is dead. If they can find any further answers than we could in a court of law, I'm all for it. As he was quoted and he told me in an interview, I am not afraid of the truth. I give them a lot of credit because what we turned up was not – it was not favorable to police and prosecutors. Right, right. It would be embarrassing, sure. Yeah. Let, me, let me share something with you, Richard, that I, I have not told many people, and I want to share it with your listeners. The original title of my book, as I got into this on the television story, I, I told my friend Joe Tillman, who's a photographer, that we worked together on this very closely for two years. I said, Joe, I've got to write a book about this. There's just too much there. And that, that is what led to the book. The book was originally going to be titled Case Closed. Uh I fully believed (laughs) when we tested the DNA, once we found it, that it would come back and prove that John Carpenter killed Bob Crane, that it was Crane's blood in Carpenter's car, case closed. It didn't turn out that way, Richard. It didn't turn out that way. I'm stunned. (laughs) Well, Bob Crane's son was stunned. And and when this all was unveiled on Fox 10, when we ran our story uh, back in November, we brought everybody, we assembled everybody in our studio. We had Bob Crane Jr. We had the prosecutor. We had the foreman of the jury. We had the investigators. We had John Carpenter's attorney in California live by satellite. When we unveiled this, I mean, it blew up on Twitter, and you know, it was it was everywhere. Um, it was around the world, frankly. People were people are fascinated with Crane. He, it's still one of the top unsolved murders of all time. It consistently ranks that way. People John, are I have a fascinated. I have to ask the evidence. I mean, after Carpenter is acquitted in '94, it, the case was still open, right? It was not a closed case. Well, prosecutors felt it was closed. I mean, they, they felt that they had their guy, they put him on trial, but because the DNA in the car, in Carpenter's car, came back inconclusive, the jury and the foreman told me, and I've, I've got a lot of this in the book, Who Killed Bob Crane, the foreman of the jury said, without that DNA, that was the big hang-up. If we had had DNA that said it was definitely Bob Crane's blood in John Carpenter's car, we would have convicted him no questions asked. But, but why why wouldn't a new a new DA come in and say, wait a minute, in, in twenty years, you know, DNA testing is light years ahead of where it was. 
let me just go rummaging through these boxes. Let me find that blood sample. And let me run new tests. Why did it take a Fox TV news reporter to decide to no, do that? There was no one to put on trial. John Carpenter had died. The guy they thought did it had died. And they had no standing. They had no case. It was basically a cold case, but they felt they had put on trial the man responsible. So they had no reason to test it. And, and you know, taxpayers probably would have said, well, what are you – what are you chasing down this rabbit hole for? This guy's dead. Why even, you know, they would have been only testing it to prove what they had, what they had done earlier, putting him on trial and, and justifying that. Well, we come along and actually we kind of did the work for him. They may have thought, hey, maybe, maybe Hook can prove what we couldn't prove 20 years ago and it will vindicate us for putting this guy on trial. That's not what happened. What came back was a DNA profile of an unknown man, not Bob Crane, and then a partial profile that's unknown, but probably not Bob Crane either. So, I mean, we, we you know, and I felt in a sense badly about it uh, because I really thought that we would be able to prove this thing and probably link it to Carpenter. It just didn't turn out that way. And as a reporter, I have to report the facts and what we, what we find. It's not what I think or believe, but what we report and what we know. And the test came back, the DNA came back, and it was not Bob Crane's DNA on that stain in the car. There are many reasons why that may have happened, and I talk about it in the book, Who Killed Bob Crane? But nonetheless, what our test results showed, not Bob Crane. But how, after 40 years, do you ensure that the, the blood sample – uh, is still is still viable. I mean, how do you how do you ascertain you know the providence and so forth? It was all sealed in snap cap vials. The last time it had been tested was right before trial in 1994. When they rummaged through these boxes, there are 11 boxes of evidence, and I go through it in the book. Um, what you know, what we found, what we discovered. It, it was like opening a time capsule, Richard. It was a time capsule of Bob Crane's apartment. It was evidence. It was it was letters, it was pictures, photographs, um, even a, a mock-up of the, of the murder weapon. Um, just incredible stuff that we came across. And then we came across the blood, the blood evidence. Bob Crane's vial of his blood taken at autopsy, a sample of John Carpenter's blood taken when they first interviewed him in Scottsdale. They brought him back here and interviewed him. That was the first interview. Uh, and then the DNA that was on the pieces of the car cut from John Carpenter's rental car. Those were all sealed in snap cap files. And we sent those, never opened them. We all wore gloves. It was all done by protocol. And the county attorney here actually bagged up the evidence to send it to Selmark to test it. So we followed a chain, a protocol to make sure that no one could later say, well, they dinked around with the evidence, this and that. We photographed everything and we even photographed them opening it at the uh, at the lab in Lorton, Virginia. All right, let's uh, dive into the phone calls. Let's go west of the Rockies. Frank is in Las Vegas, Nevada. Frank, good evening, yes. good morning. I, I used to live in Phoenix, and I worked in the county attorney's office when the Bob Crane murder case was pending. Uh, that was a case that um, they had various committees that would look at the case periodically. Uh, I know what the reporter is talking about exactly. The evidence for the Bob Crane case was kept in a basement room that was the evidence locker room of the county attorney's office. That's where they had all the videos, the equipment, and whatnot. Um, I was surprised uh, after I had left the office and read that they had brought the indictment, I was surprised that they had charged Carpy with the case because it was my understanding that the Scottsdale police, although – they zeroed in on him as a, a suspect, a person of interest. They eliminated him or moved on and actually um, had a theory that um, the, 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 they believed that there were two people involved in murdering Bob Crane. Um, a gal, a woman, that uh, he had probably done a video of and that she had told her lover boyfriend, whatever, and because whoever did murder him got permission 
from Crane to get in to his um, apartment or whatever. Um, the other thing was is that it was uh, uh, believed that the Scottsdale police were very much in over their head and that the crime scene, so many people had been in and out of the crime scene, the crime scene was contaminated. Uh, I was I was informed that Carpenter was eliminated as a suspect because he was in fear for his own life, and the you know that 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 whoever murdered Bob Crane, they were going to come for him next. So I just wanted to yeah, that's interesting. Your, um, some of what you're talking about, about is a theory held by Carpenter's defense attorney Stephen Avila. He believes two people were involved. And it is curious that in Carpenter's rental car, I, I found this interesting as well, and it cuts to Carpenter's innocence. While there's blood on the passenger door, if Carpenter, in the theory, the police theory, as you probably know, the police theory was that Carpenter bludgeoned Crane with the tripod, walked out of the apartment, made his getaway in his rental car, put the tripod against the passenger door, probably wrapped in a towel, and that's what deposited the blood on the passenger door was a murder weapon. And then he disposed of the murder weapon or packed it up and took it back to California with him in his suitcase. It would have been small enough to do that. But why no blood on the driver's side? That was odd. That is very, very odd. And even now, very much, I have a question about it. No blood on the driver's side. Nothing. Isn't that odd? Right. In other words, uh, if he was wielding the murder weapon, there would be he would um, he would and and let's face it, the blood spattering would be uh, pretty pronounced. You would think that a few droplets would end up on Carpenter's person, exactly. and then that would be transferred to the armrest in the car or exactly. on the driver's side. Yeah. Right. So you're saying that speaks to his possible innocence. Well, uh, and uh, did innocence. he have an accomplice who had that murder weapon in the car with him? I mean, th these are all things that, that, that have been thrown out there. We talked about the Kennedy assassination earlier, and I'm not kidding. There are parallels because there are as many theories as you can imagine. Indeed. The, um, the notorious sex tapes, were any of those... Um, Taken by the police? Or oh yeah. Did they find? I, and I viewed. I viewed them. By the way, Richard, I viewed oh, uh, some of those tapes because they still have some of them in evidence. Um, they all depict basically the same thing. Um, it's it's Crane um, complimenting these women. Um, they all know they're on tape. By the way, uh, these are the selfies of their day. Right. It's important selfies. to know this was consensual, and most of these women, if not all of them, knew they were being videotaped. They did. They did, and and anybody who argues otherwise, I, I don't buy it. I mean, these women are, are laughing and having a great time. Now, here's the other side of that. Some of them are drunk and intoxicated, so that's that's the other side of it. Um, so that maybe doesn't rise to consent, but these women knew because the TV set was hooked up to the video camera, and they could watch it on the TV set as it was happening. They were watching themselves performing sex, and and a lot of them got off on it. I'm going to be very honest about it. Um, and certainly Crane did, but it, they all depict very similar scenes. He, he, he compliments them. He, um, you know, he's Colonel Hogan, and he brings down their defenses, and they're a little wowed by the guy. And then uh, as he starts videotaping, they seem very comfortable with it. And uh, then, you know, Crane, interestingly enough, would edit on kind of cheesy string music underneath all these porn tapes, uh, but they were recovered, and the, and the porn tapes, not only do they depict uh, Carpenter as well in some of these because they were operating together sometimes when they were out on the road, but a lot of them are craned by himself with a woman, not with Carpenter. But it also revealed that second tripod, so they, there was evidentiary value in them as well. But any of the women uh, in these tapes, uh, I mean, were, were they and their husbands or their boyfriends questioned? Did any of them fall under suspicion? They were. They tried to track these people down. And, you know, remember in the murder scene, um, there was nothing stolen from the apartment. There was nothing taken. There was no row. There was no disturbance. So the, the theory is that Car uh, Crane let the killer into the apartment. There was no forced entry. Um, there was no sign of a struggle. There was no sign of anybody rummaging through tapes looking for 
a, a tape of Sex Acts. The only thing missing was a photo album that Crane kept. And investigators believe Carpenter took it. They believe he took it on his way out of the apartment and then kind of used that as a carrot saying, you know, have you, have you seen this, uh, this portfolio that Crane kept? Um, but if somebody were looking for the really damning stuff, they would have wanted the videotapes. And it doesn't appear that any of that was disturbed or that anybody rifled through them looking for them. Who else may have been, um, who else would have had a motive? I think, as you said, any of these women who either were ashamed of the video being taken, maybe didn't realize it when they sobered up that it had been taken, maybe their jealous husband or boyfriend, um, all of those theories are possible. And the findings on our DNA test, you know, I will tell you this unequivocally. Had the prosecutors had our DNA test in 1994, I do not believe they would have put John Carpenter on trial. All right. Hold it right there. Stay where you are, John. We'll come back on the other side. Take more questions, comments for John Hook, who killed Bob Crane, Joss Stone, Super Duper Love, taking us into the break on Coast to Coast AM. And I will be back uh, tonight, Sunday night. In the air chair for another episode of Coast to Coast AM, and I guess I'll keep bringing me back until I get it right. Uh, this month marks the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Los Angeles, one of the most colorful tales in all of UFO lore. UFO, ufologist Bill Burns uh, will join me to discuss what happened on the evening of Feb 24th, 1942, when L.A. flew into a panic as uh, what were initially believed to be Japanese enemy aircraft were spotted over the city, uh, touching off a massive barrage of anti-aircraft fire. And to this day, no one knows what was flying over the city, and many people believe the aircraft they saw were extraterrestrial. Uh, in the second half, memories are our most cherished possessions. We rely on them every day of our lives. They make us who we are. And yet, the truth is, they're far from being the accurate record of the past we like to think they are. Dr. Julia Shaw senior lecturer and researcher in the Department of Law and Social Sciences at London South Bank University, will join me to discuss the astonishing variety of ways in which our brains can indeed be led astray and why we can misappropriate other people's memories, subsequently believing them to be our own. That's tonight on Coast to Coast. Hey, if you're a fan of Coast to Coast, I'm pretty confident you're going to love Beyond Belief, George Norrie's internet television program. You get the same great paranormal phenomena, conspiracies, and all things unexplained. And I believe it's now in its sixth season. They've produced something like 250 episodes. That's remarkable. Believe me, I know how much work goes into making a TV show. You can get started watching episodes immediately. Just visit beyondbelief.com. When we come back, your questions and comments for John Hook, who killed Bob Crane. And we are into the home stretch. Where do these last four hours go? I don't know, but that always happens, right? When you're immersed in a really great conversation, time just flies. And we are having um, a remarkable a discussion with John Hook, the author of Who Killed Bob Crane, the final close-up. And uh, you can order the book from the website, whokilledbobcrane.com, whokilledbobcrane.com. Uh, um, John, so how did uh, Bob Jr. and the rest of the Crane family take the news? I mean, when, I mean, they were, like you, were expecting this to be sort of uh, close the file. It was John Carpenter. Uh, he's the one who did it. When the DNA test came back, Negative. It wasn't Bob Crane's blood on in the rental car. How did they take it? That was the hardest part, Richard, for me, because I really set out to do this for the family and for Bob Crane Jr. Because I, I, as we talked about in the outset in the first hour, you know, the pain for him and the not knowing was still pronounced. I could feel it. I mean, Anybody could, but I think as a reporter, you start to get a sense of this stuff about people. You read people, and I knew it was something that was still with him, and I wanted to settle this for him. I really did. And that was the hardest part, that I didn't get a definitive answer for them, and um, that was really tough. And he, he was great. Um, his whole take on it, and he wrote the foreword in my book, by the way, Who Killed Bob Crane. He was gracious enough to write the foreword for the book because he felt 
that the effort was worth it and that if, if we got any scintilla of further evidence about what may have happened, it was worth the effort. And he said that from the outset. He said if you can push the ball down the field even a little bit more, that would be wonderful. So he was very gracious about it and, and you know, wrote the foreword for my book, Who Killed Bob Crane, which is, to me, that, that is a, an ultimate compliment that he would do that. Very in, gracious in, man. Indeed. Uh, in Bob Jr.'s mind and in the prosecutors, the police, the investigators, is there any doubt in their mind that the, the murderer was John Carpenter? Prosecutors definitely believe it. The investigators definitely believe it. I asked Barry Vassell, who was there the day Bob Crane was found bludgeoned in his apartment. He was one of the first people on the scene. And then he reinvestigated it in 94. He, I, I asked him over and over in the television story, do you have any doubt? He said, I am 100% certain it was Carpenter. No doubt. Yes. Are you positive? Absolutely. I mean, he, there was no wiggle room. By the way, I should mention this, uh, a couple of things. You talked about why did it take so long to get to trial in 94 after the murder happened in 78 and nothing happened. It just languished for 16 years. One of the key things, and we haven't talked about it, was the discovery of a speck of tissue in John Carpenter's rental car that was believed to be subcutaneous tissue from a skull, Bob Crane's skull. Here's the problem. They found it in a photograph when they reopened the case in 1990, 1991. They found that photograph. Jim Raines, the, the investigator on it, found the photograph and saw the speck of tissue in the photograph. The problem was they looked for the actual speck and it was never collected. But that speck of tissue, they said, look, if we've got blood of Bob Crane's blood type and a speck of skull tissue in Carpenter's rental car, this is game over. If they had had the actual tissue, it would have been, but they didn't. It was, uh, it was either lost or never collected. I believe it was collected and lost. Some people think it was never collected off that door, but it showed up in a photograph. Now, that photograph became, um, you know, that was a real point of contention at the trial of John Carpenter. His attorney, Stephen Avila, argued that it wasn't even tissue and that if they don't have it, you can't consider it, which is called a Willits instruction in a uh, court of law. They gave them a Willits instruction, the jury saying you don't have to consider it if they, don't, if they can't produce a piece of evidence. So that was one of the reasons this took so long to get it to trial in, in, uh, in 1994. All right, let's go east of the Rockies. John is in Cleveland. John, good morning. Oh. Hi, John, are you there? Yes, how are you? Hey, Hi, good morning. Uh, I've always followed this uh, story myself and had an interest in it, and I always wondered, did has uh, Bob Crane's second wife ever been ruled out as a suspect, and is there any significance to the relocation of his remains to another cemetery? No. Uh, they were in the middle of a divorce, actually. Um, this is Patty, who was Fraulein Hilda on uh, Hogan's Heroes, his second wife. Um, during the time that this happened, yes, she was looked at because Bob Crane Jr. felt that she was a viable suspect because she had pecuniary gain. Uh, there was money at stake. They were in the middle of a divorce. Suddenly, Bob Crane turns up dead, and obviously, you know, the, the wife, who's about to be the ex-wife, becomes a suspect as well. She happened to be vacationing with their seven-year-old son in Bainbridge, Washington, on the island there. There are even phone records that show that Crane spoke to her the night that he was murdered. They had an argument that people overheard. Uh, the upstairs person in the apartment overheard the argument. Uh, a one-way conversation obviously didn't hear her, but heard Crane arguing with his ex-wife or about-to-be ex-wife. Um, slamming the phone down, and then he and Carpenter went out and cruised, uh, cruised the bars in Phoenix looking for women. During this, uh, during this uh, period after Crane's murder, uh, he was buried in a cemetery, then later moved to another cemetery right in, right in uh, downtown L.A. It's a really odd cemetery. Um, and th that became kind of a shrine that she, she pushed this agenda 
um, some in the family were very unhappy with that decision. But that was afterwards. So the removal of, of his remains and moving it to a cemetery was really to turn it into more of a shrine to her than anything. And when she died, uh, they're both buried together there, even though Bob Crane Jr. Uh, doesn't like that idea at all. John, thank you for that. Uh, Jay is on the wild card line in Florida. Jay, good morning. Welcome to Coast to Coast. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank I'll uh, try to speak quick so I can get all this in. Wonderful to speak with you again, Mr. Serrett, and I love the soulful, bluesy, and uh, old-school uh, R&B music selections you always play. Um, I was uh, wondering, first of all, if there was any uh, blackmail or extortion uh, attempts or reports involved with either Bob or John. And uh, what I was really wondering is uh, with the film of Autofocus with Greg Kinnear um, that, you know, depicted his fall and descent, uh, I was wondering what the uh, similarities and differences were of uh, the plot, points, characters, um, and op opposed to uh, the facts and evidence and witness testimonies um, that you had um, uncovered and came upon. Thank you for that, Jay. Um, a couple of things. Autofocus, uh, Bob Crane Jr. was a consultant on that film, and so was Richard Dawson's son, um, was also a consultant on that film. They tried to keep it as true to form as they could. I think the relationship between Crane and Carpenter and the hints of bisexuality, that is a very interesting, uh, that Carpenter was bisexual, not Crane, that Carpenter may have been. Um, that's a very interesting thing to explore and very possible. Um, the murder, though, uh, they depict the murder as someone coming through the Arcadia door. That's the door that led out to the pool from Crane's apartment. That door, when investigators got there that day, was locked. It does not appear anybody came in through there. And I outline in my book, Who Killed Bob Crane, that had somebody tried to enter that way in the dark that night, if somebody had a key or tried to uh, or had left a door open and tried to get in through there, it would have been really difficult because that's where all the video equipment was. A tangle of cords and TVs and VCRs. Somebody trying to enter that apartment stealthily, it would have been a nightmare, and they would have made noise, and Crane was a notoriously light sleeper. So that leaves the front door. And so in autofocus, they have the perpetrator coming in through the Arcadia door. I don't believe that. The front door is where I believe the per person came in, and I believe Crane let him in willingly and then went to sleep. Because also, as I point out in the book, Crane was found in his bed in boxer shorts. If he had been with a woman, he would have been naked. He was in his boxer shorts because someone else was there, and he laid down, and many people believe, and investigators do, that Carpenter was that person in the in the apartment, and the crane just laid down with his boxers on, answered the door, let Carpenter in. It was late. They were going to get some sleep, or maybe Carpenter was going to hang around the apartment until they left for the airport in the morning, and that's when the murder happened. That's what police believe. Uh, there was a bottle of scotch in uh, the apartment, and Crane did not drink scotch, apparently. You know, there, were, there, there was gin. There was... Um, uh, smugglers, old smugglers scotch. There was a, a bottle of Booth gin. A lot was made about that in an early book that was written uh, by Graysmith that, you know, th there were things in the apartment that just didn't make sense. Well, the booze was not there for Crane. The booze was there for the women who came over to ply right, them with right. alcohol when they sure. wanted. It was not for him. It was for them. And then there was an idea that there were cigarettes in the ashtray. Crane wasn't a smoker. He wasn't. He wasn't a smoker or a drinker, really. He was a very light drinker. Um, the cigarettes were primarily from Victoria Berry, who gave her statement to police in the apartment of Bob Crane. She was a chain smoker, and she was smoking like mad that day. Um, and other people who had come over to the apartment may have been smokers. But that wasn't a big deal. That People made a lot out of that, that there were things out of place. These things really weren't. They they can be explained. Uh, did you ever speak to members of the uh, the Carpenter family? No, I have not. That is on my list, actually, Richard. That is on my list. His wife, I believe, is still alive. Um, but I would like to speak with her. I have not. You mentioned uh, that uh, Carpenter spent the weekend after the murder at uh, Richard Dawson's house, who played yes. uh, Peter Newkirk in Hogan's Heroes. 
was, it was a great character, uh, Newkirk. And he but, had huge, remember, he was a huge star on Family Feud as well. He was the host absolutely. of that for years. Yes. Do, do you, th- you mentioned that Newkirk, uh, or sorry, that Dawson did not go to the funeral. Uh, do you think there may have been some guilt there because he had introduced Carpenter to Crane? That's a very interesting point. It's, it's either a little bit of that, that he didn't want to be two-faced about it, that they weren't close, and he didn't want to just show up just on ceremony. But there's another theory, that Carpenter may have told him something. That Carpenter may have, the one person he may have said something to, might have been Richard Dawson. It's and he possible. took it to his grave. He took it to his grave, if that's It's the possible, case. because one of the investigators, Jim Raines, told me that, that Dawson threw him out of his apartment in the early 90s when he went to interview him. Not his apartment, pardon me, his home in Beverly Hills. Dawson lived pretty well, married a, a very uh, a big star in Britain who was kind of considered the Marilyn Monroe of Britain. Um, he threw him out of his, out of his house, uh, very um, unhappy that he was there. And they, you know, investigators, I think, had some questions about what Dawson may have known. Just a theory. Hmm. Um, let's let's grab one more call. I think we can sw- uh, we can sneak a Jeff in Culver City in here uh, okay. on the wild card line. Jeff, good morning. Hi, Richard. Yeah, how you doing, Mr. Hook? Hey, hey first, Jeff. Richard, thanks so much for your good taste and you know the old school Motown era music. You know, I don't know what's going on with music nowadays, but it ain't like it used to be. <laughs> you but. and me both. I love it too, Richard. Good good calls on all the music tonight. Appreciate that. You but, can't go wrong with hey, Stax Records. I'm curious about the whole concept and origination of DNA technologies and applications. You know, although many researchers and forensic investigators have invested decades of their life and time into this peculiar way of identification of fathers who reject their children, yep. uh, people with probate or inheritance issues and genetic, you know, issues and all that stuff. But my question is, Mr. Hook, uh, Richard brought up an excellent point, why it took so long, 16 years, to find this uh, Mr. Uh, Crane utilizing DNA technology, especially since the methodology of this DNA wonderment is, first of all, suspect and can be used to frame individuals right. by utilizing bodily fluids and all that. Um, no, what's your overall point. assessment of this program? It's a great point, yeah. Jeff. And, uh, you know, as I got into the book, Who Killed Bob Crane, and really, really, uh, you know, uh, immerse myself in this, I had to learn a lot about DNA. And what I learned is DNA is not perfect. We think of it as C- CSI that it is the end-all and be-all. It's actually starting to raise some complicated issues now in police matters. Here's why. The more you can bore in, and we had to in this case, we, the, the testing, the sample that we had had been tested so many times, the original blood that was there was no longer visible. So they had to drill down into this and look at it with such a big magnifying glass, and I mean that figuratively, that you open the door of picking up outlier DNA that has nothing to do with the original crime. That is a real problem coming in DNA science. In other words, could the DNA that we picked up off the door, could it have been from the guy who constructed the door at the factory, the car door? Could it have been from an investigator who left his DNA there, from a simple touch of his finger? Could it have been from the lab, one of the technicians sneezing on it? These are the kind of things that are raised now as you're able to more sensitively pick up DNA when you go in with such a magnifying glass. You can start to pick up things that might take you down really dark alleys that don't have anything to do with the crime. Oh dear, very troubling. Uh, very quickly, and we have to uh, we have to say good night here. But uh, what's next? I mean, are you going to pursue this? Are you going to continue and, and try and find out who killed Bob Crane? We want to we want to try to put this in the CODIS database with the FBI. What what our sample found? We want to put it in CODIS, the National FBI uh, database, and see who that DNA belongs to. So we All right. can maybe get a better idea. John Hook, thank you so much for this. Richard, thank you. Who killed Bob Crane.com? Who killed Bob Crane.com? For George Norrie, George Knapp, Lisa Lyons, Stephanie Smith, Tom Danheiser, Dan Galanti, Chris Burroughs, Sean Ladisor, Nathan Staten, and Donna Walker. And here in Toronto, Nathan Smith, Scott Guest, and Tom Shank. I'm Richard Serrett. Thanks for your ears. 
and your voices, your beautiful voices. So long for now.